Hello, everyone. I'm Jan Durant, conservator of works of art on paper at the Manila Collection, and I'm delighted to welcome you this afternoon to our online program, On Drawing, Paper, a Foundation to Drawing. On Drawing is a new programming initiative of the Manila Drawing Institute that addresses topics ranging from the history, theory, criticism, and materiality of drawing. Leading academics, curators, and experts in the field are invited to participate alongside Manila curators and conservators. Today we're holding our second program in this ongoing series, and I'm thrilled to welcome our distinguished guest speaker, Dr. Kathleen A. Baker, who's joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Welcome, Kathy. Hi, Jan, how are you? Great, glad to have you here. Dr. Kathleen A. Baker is Conservation Librarian Emerita of the University of Michigan Library, where she was paper and book conservator and for a few years before her retirement, the exhibition conservator. She's the founder of the Legacy Press. Her imprint has received national and international acclaim and many of its nearly 30 publications have won national book awards. Kathy began her career in London as paper conservator at the Courtauld Institute of Art and she went on to become a tenured professor in paper conservation at the State University of New York's graduate program in art conservation in both Cooperstown and Buffalo, where she taught for 15 years. From 1993 to 2000, Kathy researched, wrote, and helped handbind her book about a celebrated paper historian by his own labor, the biography of Dard Hunter. In 2010, she wrote and published From the Hand to the Machine, 19th century American paper and mediums, technologies, materials, and conservation. That book received the first American Institute for Conservation Publication Award in 2012. Her other awards and honors are too lengthy to list here. However, I would like to mention that her recent induction into the paper making, the, the Hall of Papermaking Champions by members of the Hand Paper Makers of North America. We're so happy to have Kathy joining us for this program on paper making. Few things in our lives are as ubiquitous as paper. What material has stood the test of time with the same success and extensive variety and yet so often been taken for granted. Kathy will begin our program today by sharing an overview of hand and paper and machine made paper making processes and highlighting some of the resulting characteristics of paper. Afterward, I'll join her for a close look at a selection of artworks from the Manil's collection of drawings and a brief discussion about the Legacy Press. And before we begin, I would like to remind you that you're able to submit questions at any time throughout the program by emailing programs at manil.org. And now, Kathy Baker. Thank you, Jan. And thank you uh, to everyone uh, who's able to join us this afternoon. Can I have the first slide? Uh, next. Before getting into uh, discussing the surface characteristics of paper by looking at the surfaces upon which each sheet was formed, let's review how production paper was made by hand in the West for more than five centuries. The most important of the three-person crew was the Vatman, here seen in the green circle, who formed a sheet using one of a pair of mold frames and one decal that fit both frames. When he finished, he removed the decal and passed the frame to the back of the vat to lean up against the asp to drain, seen in the blue circle. The Vatman then proceeded to form another sheet with the other mold frame. While the Vatman was doing that, the Kucher, whose back, is, whose back is to us in the red oval, placed a damp felt on the stack of new sheets, which unfortunately we can't see. He then took up the drained frame, turned it over, and couched or transferred the sheet from the mold surface onto the felt. And uh, the sequence of couching is shown here at the bottom of the slide. Once a certain number of sheets had been made, the stack or post was transferred to a large standing press in the background in the black circle to remove a lot of water. 
After this initial pressing, the post was removed and the third member of the team, the layer in the yellow circle, separated the sheets of paper from the felts, returning the felts to the kutcher. The pack of paper was pressed again, resorted, pressed again, etc., and finally air dried. Next. To air dry the paper, groups of about four sheets were hung over ropes in the loft of the mill. Once dry, the so-called water leaf sheets could be sized or not, depending on the intended use. For paper to be written, drawn, or painted on, the dry sheets were tub-sized by immersing them in a warm gelatin solution and the newly sized sheets were pressed again. After pressing, packs of sized paper were often dried on cloth covered frames or trebles rather than on ropes in order to avoid the marks from the ropes that could disfigure the sheet. When the sized paper was dry, the front and back surfaces were coated with a thin water and abrasion resistant layer of gelatin. Next. Paper was first made in China, perhaps a hundred years before the Common Era. Transmission of the technology spread slowly, first eastward to Korea and Japan, and then westward to India through Islamic countries, along North Africa, and finally into Moorish Spain in the 11th century. The industry took root in Europe, first in Genoa and Fabriano, Italy, in the 13th century, and from then until the mid 18th century, European papermaking technology and materials remained virtually unchanged. This presentation is but a brief overview of both the traditional handmade and the new mach paper machines that resulted in a wider range of papers made for artists beginning in the 19th century. On the left is one of a pair of recently made antique laid hand molds constructed by Timothy Moore for the University of Iowa's Center for the Book with the decal in place. This is the oldest kind of hand mold used to make paper in the West from the 13th through the mid 18th century. To the right at the top is a detail of the screen on the frame showing a wooden rib underneath the horizontal laid wires the vertical pair of chain wires, which keep the laid uh, wires in place and also create a distinct gap between each one of them, and a wire stitch securing this laid screen directly to the rib. Because the laid screen is sewn directly to the wooden ribs, water drains preferentially along the ribs, depositing more fiber there creating the thicker, darker areas in transmitted light uh, and are called the rib shadows. Here, Tim Barrett is hoping, holding up an antique laid mold immediately after dipping it into pulp so that we can see that most of the free water is dripping off the ribs, not off the screen. Next. Shown here are a few examples of watermarked antique laid papers seen in transmitted light. We can see the laid and the chain lines and the darker vertical rib shadows. Rib shadows not centered under the chain lines in the indicated paper, the uh, second from the left, means that this screen was a replacement and the screen and the frame underneath it were not not a perfect match to one another. Next. On the left, the raking light is coming from the left side and the chain lines, seen here, uh, uh, some of them along, uh, indicated by the black arrows, appear distinctly while the laid lines are nearly invisible. Conversely, on the right, the light is coming from the top and now the laid lines appear distinctly while the chain lines are nearly invisible. This demonstrates that turning a sheet of paper 90 degrees back and forth gives us a much better picture of all of its character, uh, surface characteristics. Next. In 1757, a completely new kind of paper appeared in John Baskerville's 
Virgil. At the left are two are the two papers that appeared in this book. At the top is the the Virgil wove paper, which was used in half of the book, while below it, an unwatermarked antique lake paper was used for the other half. I was particularly interested in the Virgil wove because it looked very different to me than uh, the antique laid paper that one would expect to see at this time. And on the right, we note that the thicker th uh, thread, a slub, at the red arrow denotes that the mold screen on which the Virgil wove was made was woven with homespun yarn. And it must have been a textile rather than a woven wire screen as has long been assumed by paper historians. Next. The wove paper in the Virgil was not completely revolutionary, however. In Asian paper making, wove paper predates the Virgil wove by centuries and was made by placing a cloth over a laid screen, very much like the antique laid screens that we've seen. But instead of the laid lines being made of wire, in Asian molds, they are made from bamboo or from grass. Here we see James Watman the first and second who were responsible for making the first Western wove paper in one of their mills in Maidstone in Kent, probably in the famous Turkey Mill seen here on the map in black. There is a possibility that Watman uh, I learned about the Asian technique of placing a cloth over the bamboo screen to make wove paper and that he decided to experiment with this technique and made the Virgil wove. Next. In 2017, I decided to experiment with replicating the virtual wove. In phase one on the left, I tested five different cloths by securing each of them to a small antique laid mold lent to me by Timothy Moore. There is one decal that fits all five of these molds. In phase two on the right, I took one cloth from phase one and added four new cloths. One of the second phase claws, indicated here by a red star, was wetted and laid onto a larger laid mold down at the bottom right to show how, how a thin cloth with an open weave does conform to the chain lines so that they and the rib shadows are still visible in the paper, but not very distinct. Next. The top row shows me making paper on one of the five small cloth covered molds uh, at, uh, during a visit to Tim Barrett in the University of Iowa Center for the Book in the spring of 2017. Once those test sheets were pressed and assessed, Tim Barrett made paper seen in the uh, lower row on a slightly larger antique laid mold with a strip of cloth laid over it instead of actually secured across the entire surface of the screen. And this was secured in place by the decal during sheet formation. I'll show the results from this test in a minute. Next. Here, Tim and I are forming sheets on a much larger antique laid mold with a strip of cloth again placed over the central area. This mold was approximately the same size as the pair used to make the Virgil papers, about 19 by 24 inches. Next. In this slide, we see the paper made on that sort of medium sized mold a couple of slides back. And if you look at the, uh, the parts indicated in yellow uh, labeled laid, those are the uncloth covered parts of the antique laid mold. And they give us all the indications of being made on that mold. You can see the laid lines, the chain lines, and the uh, rib shadows. In the center area, bracketed in red, um, we see indistinct chain lines and also rib shadows. And when we compare these to uh, typical uh, ver Virgil wove papers, seen on the right. Um, these I think are very comparable and leads me to believe that this actually is how Watman made that first paper. Next. <laughs> 
In the circle is the uh, JW watermark standing for James Wattman in what I call the perfect wove paper used for the 1759 edition of John Milton's Paradise Regained. To make this paper, it is possible that two layers of cloth were placed over a laid mold, thus eliminating all marks except for the watermark, which was sewn to the top textile. So we see no chain lines, no rib shadows, uh, just a very faint weave pattern. Uh, but essentially, this is uh, what I would call and, and do call perfect wall paper. Next. This paper, made by the Wattman Mill, appeared intermittently, I'm talking about the perfect wove paper, in printed books for the next 20 years, but this new kind of paper seems to have drawn very little attention. That is, except for the artist Thomas Gainsborough, who presumably tried to purchase Wattman's perfect wove paper. In 16, in, uh, excuse me, in 1767, after inspecting the perfect wove paper in the New Bath Guide, Gainsborough wrote to the publisher, James Dodsley, quote, Sir, I beg you to accept my sincerest thanks for the favor you have done me concerning obtaining wove paper for drawings. I had set my heart on getting some of it, as it is so completely what I have long been in search of. I am at the moment viewing the difference of the laid paper you send and the bath guide paper, holding them edgewise or in raking light to the light and could cry my eyes out not to see those furrows. And of course, by furrows, he's referring to the marks from the antique laid mold. And here you can compare the surfaces in the same light situations between antique laid paper and wove paper. Next. Finally, in 1778, the first loom to weave wire into a fine cloth was developed. And if 1778 is the earliest date when a finely woven wire screen could have been made for the hand mold, then the screens used for the Virgil wove and for the later perfect wove must have been covered with a layer or layers of cloth not wire, as my experiments have confirmed. On the left is a pair of wove hand molds with two mold frames and one matching decal. These are both English molds made in the early 20th century and in my collection. And on the right is a detail of the woven wire screen and the holes punched around the edges to speed up water drainage from the pulp. Next. Fairly soon after 1778, it seems that mold makers discovered that if a layer of horizontal wires was sewn directly to the ribs and the upper wove, uh, sorry, and the upper woven wire screen was secured on top of that layer, then rib shadows would be eliminated from the paper. These molds are called modern wove or more commonly just wove. When viewed from the back, as we see here on the right, we can see the interleaving horizontal layer of widely spaced wires in the green oval and thinner vertical support wires in the yellow oval that keep the top woven wire screen rigid and to separate it from the ribs. Next. In these transmitted light images, we see no rib shadows because these, because the woven wire screen uh, of the mold that on which these papers were made is not touching the ribs. In some early wove papers, such as the one on the left dated 1806, a distinct weave pattern from the woven wire screen can be seen, but this, this is fairly rare. Lots of times you see either a very faint weave pattern or no weave pattern at all. Next. In neither of these raking light situations are strong marks from the wove screen apparent. The only difference in the surfaces of these 
wove, as well as laid papers, is how they were treated after the initial pressing. For example, if pressed just a few times, the paper would have a rough surface, uh, often denoted as a capital R. If pressed numerous times, it was flatter, but still had some texture. And this is often denoted as cold press or abbreviated to CP. If a very smooth surface was wanted, the dry sheet of paper was, placed, was plated or glazed uh, and denoted often as hot press or HP. So you can change the, the surface qualities of the paper considerably by how you press it or how you treat it afterwards. Next. Some decades after the modern wove hand mold was invented, the same construction was applied to the laid mold using two layers of horizontal wires. The first separating the top laid screen from the ribs. As I hope you can see, in, particularly in the detail. It's a little hard to see, but there are actually two layers that look almost exactly the same. Next. Here are a few modern laid papers that feature laid and chain lines. You can see those quite distinctly, as well as watermarks, but there are importantly no rib shadows. So this tells us that these papers were probably, well, had to have been made at least after 1800. Next. As a review, these four papers show the progression of the mold frame and screen construction, either antique or modern. And most of the time, these characteristics can easily be seen in the paper. So antique laid starts in the 13th century and uh, goes forward to today. The Virgil wove and perfect wove papers were only made uh, between 17, actually about 1754, the book was published in 57, uh, through the 1770s, uh, made on cloth is my conjecture. And then modern uh, wove or wove starting in the late 18th century onward and modern laid from the early 19th century onward. Next. For most of the 19th century, artists preferred handmade over machine-made paper. And as opposed to America, whose handmade, uh, whose hand paper making operations closed down fairly rapidly in favor of machines, handmade paper continued to be made in Britain and, and Europe. If American artists wanted high quality handmade papers for their artwork, they had to purchase imported British or European made paper. And the favorite among those wove papers were watermarked J. Wallman. Next. At the very end of the 18th century, Frenchman Nicolas Louis Robert drew up plans for a paper making machine. In the, dec in the first decade of the 19th century, a machine based on Robert's idea was commercially viable in England, financed by the Fortinair brothers who were London stationers. In 1839, their name became associated with this machine called the Fortinair. Here is a drawing of a mid 19th century Fortinair showing the endless woven wire loop uh, marked out here in red. And by this time, so the paper was formed on this woven wire loop. So it is in fact a wove paper and it always is a wove paper. By this time, the dandy roll marked here in blue uh, had been invented. Next. The dandy rolls primary function was to press out more water from the web of paper, but it could also impress a laid and chain pattern, as well as a watermark, and I put that in quotations, into the wet wove paper. This meant that machine made writing and drawing papers could look very much like handmade modern laid papers, except that when you look at them really carefully, particularly in transmitted light, 
uh, and raking light, as we see here at the right side of the screen, you can see, uh, perhaps not, not here so well, but there is a wove pattern sort of underlying these um, sort of fake uh, laid and chain marks, uh, which have been impressed into the paper by the dandy roll. I'm afraid the raking light shots are really not very uh, uh, readable here. Uh, I apologize for that. Next. The second machine invented by Englishman John Dickerson, Dickinson, I'm sorry, came into commercial use in England by uh, 1810. Known as the cylinder machine or the vat and mold machine, it util utilizes a large diameter whole hollow cylinder A in the diagram below that revolves partially submerged in a vat of pulp. Aided by the suction created inside the rotating cylinder, a layer of pulp, denoted here by the red line, is pulled onto the surface of the cylinder uh, screen where it remains for only a second or two before it comes into contact with an endless felt, denoted by the blue line. Together they pass between cylinder A and the couching roll C, where some water is squeezed out. Supported by the felt, the paper web then passes between two press rolls at E where more, more water is removed. And after this, the paper separates from the felt and is wound onto a reel or travels into a series of dryers in much the same way as for the four Janaires. Next. For most of the 19th century, cylinder machines were used to make thin paper for newspapers, tissues, and other specialty uses, while Forginaire made papers were more broadly used, particularly in books uh, for book printing. Beginning in the early 20th century, however, some cylinder machines were covered with screens that were watermarked and could be either wove, modern laid, and even antique laid to make imitation handmade papers. And these were used and in fact are still used by artists and fine printers. On the left is a close up of a cylinder machine, uh, I, excuse me, a cylinder rotating in a vat of pulp with the parts labeled. A is the watermarked laid screen. B, the waterproof strips at the edges acting as the decal. C, the paper. D, the endless felt. And E, the coaching roll. On the right is an image from Dard Hunter's book, Papermaking, showing two ways that waterproof decal strips can be used to create different kinds of paper. On the left, to make single sheets of paper with four decal edges. And on the right, sheets with two decals and two torn edges. Next. Some of these kinds of paper were and can continue to be confusingly watermarked mold made, which sounds like it's handmade, but it actually is made on the cylinder machine. And it is often very difficult to tell these papers apart from handmade papers because they exhibit the same characteristics. And on the left, we see uh, a paper that looks very much like a modern laid paper, complete with watermarks. And indeed, this sheet of paper was sold as a handmade sheet of paper. In fact, it was made on a cylinder machine. The side edges are decal edges and the top and bottom edges are torn edges. On the right is the hands and hand and arrow paper made by the Worthy Paper Company in America in the 1930s. And this paper actually looks very similar to uh, some antique laid papers um, that I've seen, including a watermark. Again, I believe in this sheet, it's a little hard to tell from this image, but I think that the bottom edge is a decal edge and the side edges are torn edges. Next. This brief presentation is only an introduction to paper making a technology that continues to fascinate me even after 50 years. 
I hope this talk has both whetted your appetite to learn more about how paper was made and enables you to better recognize the basic characteristics of paper used in works of art. Uh, uh, in works of art. And now, Jan Gurant and I will discuss how these characteristics might have influenced artists and how they can better inform our reading of a few works of art from the Menil collection of drawings. Thank you. Full presentation. If we were together right now at the Drawing Institute, I would have pulled some artworks into our study room. So um, I just want to remind our audience that if you would have questions, you can email them at any time to programs at manil.org. And now let's have a look at a few drawings. Next. So um, this drawing uh, was of interest to me for a number of reasons. And unfortunately, we don't have hours to talk about every um, <laughs> sheet we're bringing up. But I, I thought it and was- And we could too. And we could too. Um, I think that it's particularly interesting because of the time period and the fact that it's unattributed and the fact that it's gridded for transfer. If you bring up the next slide, please, we'll see a closer detail that um, shows you a little bit more of that detail. And we can see from this, from this detail, I hope you can all see um, the horizontal laid lines that are moving across the sheet from side to side. And if you're looking for characteristics like this, perhaps to determine uh, not only to describe the characteristics of the paper on which these kinds of drawings were made, but also in a more uh, serious way to actually to try to date undated drawings by the kind of paper that was used. Um, again, looking at this sheet uh, with the raking light coming down, I think probably from the top in this particular instance. Um, but again, this my, my idea of turning the sheets 90 degrees so that you can get the full spectrum of what the different surfaces look like. This is very hard to do if the paper remains in a static position and the overall light, which is coming down, is coming down from the, from over your head. But um, I, I love this kind of surface because the whether the artist um, was annoyed as, as Gainsborough was by those little furrows, um, Probably, the artist probably wasn't annoyed by it because there wasn't any choice. This is what this is how paper looked, and um, and you just dealt with it because everybody had to deal with it. Um, but um, I I maybe because I know and love paper so well that I love being able to see these characteristics in the paper. It just gives me more of uh, an insight into the the kinds of molds that the paper maker was using um, and the kinds of felts that they were using because of the felt impression into the surface of the paper. And, and it, it's just a joy to, to look at, at uh, drawings like this. Well, I'm sorry that I don't have a, a detail of the verso of this sheet because, it, you know, an artist would have had a choice of using um, the side of the sheet that would have had a stronger felt impression versus a, a stronger impression of, of the lines. And in this case, I think knowingly preparing a drawing for transfer, the lines are actually an aid in that um, for the artist, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, I also wanted, if I could say just very briefly, I think we have to remember that before electricity, that that everybody was working either uh, by firelight, by candlelight, or by window light, uh, or if they were, unless they were outside. And so the light that they were working by was almost always going to be a raking light. So the surfaces of the papers were very, very obvious to them, much more obvious to them than they are to us today, because we are f forced in most cases, uh, unless you have somebody great like Jan who 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 under appreciates these things can actually create situations where you can look at the paper in much the same way that the artist did. 
Right. Um, Tony, would you bring up the next slide, please? So this wonderful um, George O'Keefe drawing, one thing that has always struck me about this charcoal drawing is just the movement, the movement of the composition. And um, if you bring the next slide, we can see a, a detail of this sheet and what it's doing um, to aid in that mo movement, that motion, that verticality. Right. Um, what I what I saw I, we we had been through these slides uh, a little earlier, a few days earlier. So I'm not speaking totally extemporaneously, but this is this looks like a Strathmore sheet, um, probably mold made. Uh, with a laden chain design, you can sort of see the chain lines going horizontally across the sheet. Uh, across the sheet, these white lines that in, in interplay with the black strokes. But there's also a very very strong weave impression from the felt on which this uh, paper was pressed against. And uh, as Jan has already pointed out, you're going to see that the two sides of the paper are always going to be slightly different, if not dramatically different, because there are ways of treating one side of the sheet without treating the other side of the sheet with different textures of felts upon which the sheets are cooched, um, et cetera. Let's look at another drawing. Um, this Susan Fracon is um, such a bold composition, such a strong, um, composition, wet medium. And if we turn now to the next slide and the verso of the sheet, uh, <laughs> yeah, you're laughing, Kathy. <laughs> what are you seeing? <laughs> well, it's obviously the, the wet medium is reacting quite strongly with the absorbency of the sheet, um, which leads me, well, you could, you could, say there are two different reasons why that might be happening. One, the, the sheet is actually quite heavily sized. And so when, um, uh, with gelatin, for example, so I'm not sure this is gelatin sized, but uh, so that different parts of the paper react very uh, differently and, and uh, dramatically to the application of a wet medium. I think this, probably is sized because I don't think if this had been an unsized paper acting more or less like blotting paper, the, the medium, and also if you look at the front again, the edges of the paint are quite sharp. Um, and so that denotes that the paper surface is sealed so that the medium actually doesn't spread um, and stays exactly where it's, it was intended to be. Uh, again, you don't see any of that distortion if you have just a, an overall uh, sort of normal light with the light, the light coming evenly from both sides. Exactly. And when we were preparing for an exhibition of her drawings a number of years ago, um, the initial photography was done with normal lighting and the character of the sheet just wasn't revealed enough. If you go to the next slide, we see another Susan Fracon drawing, and I've left up here a description that Fracon uses for this sheet. She is very deliberate about her choice of paper, and this is watercolor on handmade agate burnished, laid old Indian ledger paper. Now, in the syntax of discussing drawings, our public facing medium would only ever say paper. For our back of house, we have extensive characterization that we would have in our records. But in the case of an artist being so specific, you know, we know that this was a very intentional choice and the burnishing of the surface of that paper makes this medium sit in a way that it wouldn't have on another sheet. This is quite different from the last sheet of paper that we saw of hers. Very, very different. Um, uh, this this ledger paper would have been um, probably surfacized with starch, um, possibly using a brush after the paper uh, had been formed and dried. And then to further uh, 
make the surface of the paper not only smooth, but even more resistant to the application of a water-based uh, ink, it, it would have been burnished. Um, and typically agate was used, uh, very large agate stones with a smooth surface would have been used to burnish these sorts of papers. It doesn't say what the dimensions are, but obviously this is a fairly long piece of paper. Um, I'm assuming, and uh, I am also assuming that this paper would have been perhaps accordion folded and uh, placed into um, a ledger book, or it possibly could have been a sheet of paper that then was um, cut or torn into individual sheets and uh, folded and made into books. Um, I'm not. I'm not at all conversant uh, with the uh, ways that um, Indian ledger books were constructed. But it's well, a very, sorry, it's a very unique kind of paper. Uh, one which if you see, you immediately recognize it as being what it is. These papers, um, I, I will say, were probably double cooched uh, or actually double formed so that two dips were done. And so it is actually fairly easy to delaminate these papers into two parts. Mm -hmm. If you look at them in transmitted light, you will often, you will see laden chain lines, often with double chain lines, um, but then they never quite match. And that's because um, there, there, there are two sheets of paper formed one on top of the other. One has a very strong uh, laden chain design. That's the first one that's formed, and the second one has an even less one, which seems to kind of cancel out the first one when you look at it in transmitted light. That's probably more information that you wanted to know, but <laughs> there's never, we, we could talk about this one all day too, but we, let's look at the next drawing. And this one, speaking of size, is nearly five and a half feet tall. And I want to read a, a quote from the artist, Robin O'Neill. Um, I had an opportunity to interview her and we spoke about this work and she, these are her words. This was um, all made with mechanical pencil. So it's important to note that it's not even a regular art supply store pencil or charcoal. It's an office supply mechanical pencil, 0.5 millimeter and 0.3 millimeter lead. So really, really tiny and exact. This is just me. I realized after many, many years of working smaller and with a looser material that I just kept thinking of my mechanical pencil and nice, clean, white, solid, smooth paper. And of course that paper had to be machine made to be this size um, because in, uh, it, it is not impossible to make handmade paper this size, but fairly impractical and would have been incredibly expensive. But the machines allowed you to make reels of paper rather than individual sheets of paper. The reels of paper for most of the 19th century were, were cut into sheets because the pr printing presses were still sheet fed presses, not real fed, real fed presses. Um, but the, the ability to make sheets of such varying widths and lengths uh, towards the end of the 19th century made, as, as artists were expanding more the idea of um, the kinds of works that they wanted to do, particularly working on paper, the ability to work big um, became a, a, a reality. Whereas before I, you had to piece sheets of paper together in order to get a big sheet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One of my favorite works in our collection is a John Cage drawing that's um, over 30 feet long. So um, this is a very familiar um, to our collection. Let's look at another drawing. And again, um, isn't it beautiful? This via Selman's, um, when you look at the composition here and you think about, you know, this is a familiar composition for the artist and let's picture ourselves in the position of choosing the paper and look at the next slide and see what that paper looks like in a closer raking light and how the composition and the surface of the paper seem um, intertwined. Yes, exactly. And the, and the, the, this paper probably would have been designated as R or rough 
Um, and the, the nice thing about, well, it's nice to, to some uh, uh, works of art and not to others, of course, but here it is used to its utmost advantage in that there is so much surface area that can reflect back light to the eye of the viewer. And this helps to create these areas of sort of almost sparkling sort of light uh, dashed um, uh, image of these of these rocks. Um, the the artist obviously chose this paper very very carefully, um, and used it to its its utmost advantage. I agree. So um, the next drawing we're looking at this um, Carl Stanley Benjamin is a little bit of a surprise. I think when you when you see this really high contrast image, this graphic image. And the next slide you bring up shows a detail of the surface of that paper. So look at what the artist is doing here and how would this drawing read differently from a, a foot away or across the room? I, in a way, I'm sort of surprised that there is that much texture in this paper. Um, because you would think I would have thought that that might might interfere with the with this really as you say the very sh uh, stark contrast and sharp edges of this drawing certainly seen in overall light um, this doesn't seem to have affected um, the artist or the intent of the artist at all I'll just say that this is probably a cylinder main machine when you get this sort of diagonal wove texture that often uh, indicates that that you're dealing with a cylinder made wove paper although I can't say that for sure I'd have to to see this in transmitted light um, but it's a very it looks like a very robust paper and um, it's a it's a wonderful drawing mm -hmm. I'm just I'm just glad that the paper didn't interfere <laughs> as I might have expected if well, I had chosen it myself it's an unquestionably intentional choice by the artist and it makes me curious to see more drawings and look at what kind of selections were made for different compositions. Mm -hmm. So um, let's see our next one. So this, this is um, an artwork that includes both of these sheets as one piece, um, lost and, and found. So the next slide we see is a detail of the, the lost. And I think that in this, this is a raking light shot. And I have to point that out because um, it, the paper is so smooth that it's hard to really see any texture here. And mm -hmm. when you look at what the artist has accomplished with using graphite in this work, it's incredibly fine. And it, uh, it would be hard to imagine um, hand writing all of this text without having a very smooth surface to work on. Absolutely. Um, both smooth in terms of the paper texture, but also my guess is this is probably pretty well surface sized um, in order to be able to hold that edge. Um, the, the, I mentioned that the gelatin surface sizing, there are other kinds of surface sizing, of course, uh, especially uh, today. But the, um, one of the goals of the 19th century artists were to uh, use, be able to find a paper where they could erase um, without actually disrupting the surface of the paper because if they erased and then drew over or painted over an erased area, if the surface had been abraded in any way, then it would accept the medium in a very different way um, in that particular area and would have uh, essentially ruined um, the artist's intent in that area. And so choosing papers on the quality of both the surface texture and the amount of sizing uh, was, was something that was very well known and, and artists uh, did a lot of research to find the right sort of paper. Mm -hmm. Well, let's look at the overall raking light mm -hmm. shot 
of the sound sheet of paper that the artist used in this composition. And I, I, I love this piece so much because um, if there was ever an artwork that let you know that the artist was really consciously thinking about paper, <laughs> this, this might be it. <laughs> Yes, this the the use of um, these either papers in really bad condition or um, poor quality papers um, made for ephemeral purposes, um, wrapping paper, for example, or uh, that that kind of thing. Um, a lot of artists, uh, of course, were not rich um, most of their lives, and so they tended to use any. This is particularly true of pre-machine made paper but tended to use any paper that came to hand. And so the use of brown or um, poor quality papers is not uncommon. Uh, even among old master drawings, um, very often you will see a deliberate choice of paper, uh, which to our eyes looks um, not very nice, uh, but to their eyes uh, had a quality that they really wanted to um, be part of their uh, their image, what they intended. I think the bigger question here, or maybe not the bigger question, but a, a, an important question is how much do you, how much conservation do you think is 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 acceptable? Um, you know, to make this sheet of paper look completely pristine would be would not be a good idea. I think I, I think it would completely destroy the artist's intent. Uh, absolutely. I mean, we are so consciously aware of the wishes of the artist, the artist's intent in um, how their art should look. And I would say that this is an extreme raking light that we're looking at. If you were coming to the gallery, this would be um, more like two slides ago where you saw um, the image in normal light and you, you didn't, you weren't aware of all of these distortions. And um, we're highlighting them here, but um, the average viewer wouldn't see the drawing in this light. And I wouldn't see it appropriate to do any treatment whatsoever to this particular sheet for the particular artwork that it is. Right. I, I um, think when you're, when you're putting any art on exhibit, you should be conscious of what light can do both to enhance the artwork and to diminish some of the things that that don't enhance it, um, and so if you look at the at the these two drawings like this, uh, you you don't even really notice the damage, a lot of the damage in in the um, the found piece. Um, so it's. Uh, it's, it's really important. I think this is upside down actually. Um, it's really important that the, um, that the exhibit uh, crew understand um, that what light can do and what it, what it should not do. Right, and in fact, this artist was very specific to um, describe this as a found paper and it was clear that it was their intent to be using a, a paper that was in this condition. So we should move along because we still okay. have a few more to speak about. Um, ah, yes, this uh, Jennifer <laughs> Bornstein uh, rubbing, this beautiful um, rubbing of a camera. And uh, we have a, a detail of the lower left corner there. And if we move to the next slide, we can see in more extreme raking light, the sort of conformity to the camera that the the paper had in order for this artwork to be created. Is this a uh, an Asian paper? Um, you know, I I cannot tell you too much about this paper. It, in fact, if you um, look at if you look at this edge uh, in mm -hmm. the detail, um, it looks torn to me. Yes, um, and there are, there are actually quite a lot of fibers coming out of that torn edge. They look very long. They're very um, long fibers. Yeah, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if this isn't either a Japanese or a Chinese um, sort of hansho, ha, hosho paper, um, uh, which would be very soft and malleable um, for, for use specifically with this sort of um, 
uh, technique of, of, of drawing. That makes a lot of sense to me too. And I, I, particularly wanted us to see that that torn edge for that reason. Um, this is one, I, I like to take every drawing and see it in transmitted light, but unfortunately this one I've never seen mm. out of the frame. So um, it's one I'm still getting to know. Uh, let's move along to our next slide and then the next. Oh, yeah. ah, yes, this, this Leon Polk Smith is wonderful. Um, this artist, does a lot of work where the surfaces of paper are removed through scraping or tearing. And the, the surface of this doesn't represent that well in these images, but it's a very glossy red surface that has mm -hmm. been torn away to reveal um, the, the mark that creates the, the image. Right, I, I think this is probably a red coated paper Mm -hmm. um, so pigment mixed with some sort of binder um, and applied to the paper. Uh, but it's ju it just sits more or less on the surface of the paper. So tearing uh, sections away to reveal the layers of paper. And we often think that the paper is very two-dimensional. It's actually very three-dimensional and has many, many layers to it. And all of those layers can actually be quite different in terms of their aging properties. Uh, and, uh, and, then, and then finding a paper that will, when you, tear, when you tear it like this, whether you're tearing with the grain direction or with, uh, opposite the grain direction, meaning do you get straight lines or not? Um, you know, obviously he took that into consideration because he didn't want fairly straight lines. And so tended to tear across the grain direction, which gives you like tearing a coupon out of a newspaper tends mm -hmm. to give you these very, very irregular edges, which give the whole work uh, a really exciting, vibrant, um, motion-filled look about it. Yeah. Let's see the next one. So um, I have a saying that I'm constantly repeating, which is paper is three-dimensional. And the next slide, it, with the raking light on this drawing, <laughs> Um, illustrates how this um, really nondescript paper, the artist has imposed this dimensionality on it by his treatment of it. Um, and again, um, this is a case where when we see the artist's hand to such an extreme in, um, extent, it's part of the artwork. And um, I, I am particularly fond of, of this work by Robert Gober. Yes, it's it's uh, very much like the um, the found drawing, where light plays such an important part in your being able to appreciate more of this drawing than just the lines that you see uh, on the right hand uh, on the left hand side. And I wonder, this looks like it would might have been used as a sort of paper airplane or something. <laughs> so you know, bringing that sort of playfulness into the drawing as well, I think is is an important feature of it. Yeah, there's a different relationship you have with the art when you're um, across the room and as you approach and get closer mm -hmm. and have an opportunity to see it in different lights. Um, in this uh, final slide, I just want to point out that, you know, whether artists are choosing papers intentionally to suit their needs in drawing or finding inspiration in scraps of paper, there's just no denying the deliberate relationship between artist and, and paper. And I, I hope you've gotten a feel for that today. And um, in our next slide, I'm going to share with you some images of a few of my uh, favorite books from the Legacy Press, which uh, Kathy, your imprint, you've contributed immensely um, to our ability to appreciate drawings through having a deeper knowledge. And um, I have just a few minutes now to to talk about that. And I'll remind our viewers that you can email any questions to programs at manil.org. But Kathy, um, would you like to give us, um, first of all, can may I ask you just to explain, I, I think that the, I love the title of Papermaker's Tears and <laughs> it might be a phrase that's not so familiar to all of our viewers. Yes, in fact, they might even read it as Papermaker's Tears. 
but it is tiers. These, these dots, uh, these uh, round circles that you see in this paper uh, were caused by drops of water falling on a newly formed sheet and they act as uh, meteorites hitting the, the moon surface. It's, it's exactly the same sort of thing. Um, and in this particular paper, which is, uh, I believe, a Japanese paper, this is done deliberately, but a lot of times in handmade sheets uh, that weren't made all that carefully, you can find the odd paper makers tier or two, um, which are simply drops of water coming from the Vatman or the Kuchar's hands as the sheets are manipulated in this very wet form. Um, this actually was the a suggestion of Titania, uh, Ta Tatiana Ginsberg, who's the editor of this series. Uh, and my essay about the uh, Virgil Wove appears in this first volume. Um, Tim Barrett, of course, is, is a star in the field of hand paper making. And uh, I was so proud that I could publish his book back in 2018. And then my book, uh, From the Hand to the Machine, was published in 2010. And if, you're, if you have any questions about what I've presented so far, most of what I've presented is in my book. <laughs> and so you can read it there. Well, I, I just like to point out too that Papermaker's Tears is a collection of essays, and uh, one of which features your uh, description of your Virgil project, which sort of reads like a detective story. Mm -hmm. Yes, and also there's an essay in there about the Indian um, papers that are agate burnished um, as well. So. Uh, there's there's quite a range of uh, really important articles in in Paper Makers Tears Volume One and and Volume Two is coming out either later this year or early next year. Oh, wonderful! Well, we've had a question from our audience of about the consideration of the length of time paper works can be on display in the museum and how that might vary based on the different types of paper. And um, I think that. That's a topic you, you, everyone is used to coming to a museum and seeing uh, drawings galleries in lower light levels, mm -hmm. used to seeing shorter exhibition schedules for works on paper. And it, it is a combination of um, the medium that's applied to the paper and the paper itself. And you have to look at the weakest link. And sometimes the paper is the weaker link, depending on how it's made. And other times it's the medium that is on top of the paper. So uh, we look carefully at each work individually, but in general, um, our conservative attitude to try to preserve the works for the longest history possible and the largest audience possible is to shorten the exhibitions to three or four months for works on paper. And also that gives us more of a chance to um, share more of the collection, if not in the exhibition gallery than in our drawing study room, which is um, where we would be today if, if we were having this in, in person. Um, Kathy, I, th I can't thank you enough for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure exploring paper with you. Well, I, I this has been so much fun, particularly the, the second half. <laughs> and I hope people enjoyed. It was very, it, it's very overwhelming to get all of that information in, in a very short period of time. Um, but I, as I said, I hope people will be uh, prompted to seek out more information if they're really interested. And Jan, um, who's a former student of mine, and I'm very proud of her. Um, <laughs> I, I uh, uh, thank you so much for inviting me and everybody at, at, at the Menil that we've been associated or that I've been associated with. Um, I, I really appreciate all of their help and thank them very much, um, well, but particularly we, you, Jen. We've loved having you here today. And you know, um, artists are among the most discriminating consumers of paper, and the drawings they create are. Um, demonstrate their dialogues with the medium. And I hope this program today will enhance everyone's appreciation for that relationship, and particularly during your next visit to the Manil Drawing Institute. So thank you for joining us today, and, and please mark your calendar for these upcoming events. Um, by the way, this program was recorded and will be available on the Manil YouTube channel. But on Wednesday, May 12th, the artist Ronnie Horn will join Manil's senior curator, Michelle White, 
for a discussion of her work, Gold Field, currently on view in the museum's modern and contemporary galleries. And on May 26, the Manil Collection, um, the Manil Drawing Institute's inaugural pre-doctoral fellow, Saskia Verlan, will deliver a lecture exploring Cy Twombly's critical engagement with the work of Leonardo da Vinci. So please visit manil.org slash events to learn more about these and other upcoming Manil programs and events. And thank you again for joining us. We look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.